The case has become legendary. Complete with numerous witnesses telling compelling stories. And yes, it even has this video that the U.S. calls unidentified. The Nimitz encounter continues to fascinate and intrigue anyone with an interest in the unknown. What is that? But what is the true science behind what we know? Some explore the facts, but few dissect the science. My guest today has done just that. Robert Powell, who co-authored a 270-page scientific breakdown of findings relating to the Nimitz event, is here to share what they found. Stay tuned. You're about to journey inside the Black Vault. That's right, everybody. As always, thank you so much for tuning in and making this your podcast and your live stream of choice. I'm your host, John Greenwald Jr., creator of theblackvault.com. And today joining me is a show I've been looking forward to for quite some time. Robert Powell is about to step into the vault. Robert, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day and, and speaking to me. Well, thanks, John. Thank you for having me on your show. Well, I've been looking forward to this show and and uh, talking to you about something that I don't feel is my strong point, and that is the science behind analyzing some of these videos. And you guys have done an extraordinary job, very much in depth on some of that, which we'll get into in a little bit. But I always like to start with a little bit of background. Why are you why are you in this field, so to speak? Uh, sure, that's a that's a great question. Uh, my wife asks me that question all the time. Um, actually, when I was a teenager, I read a book by Dr. J. Allen Hynek. It's called The UFO Experience. It's written in a scientific mode. I was kind of a geeky science kid in high school. And so I read that and that really garnered my interest. But, you know, then I, I was doing a lot of other things. I debated in college. I got my degree, got married. And so you kind of leave the UFO stuff behind, right? You've got to live your life. So, um, uh, had a couple of kids, you know, they graduated. So I was fortunate. I went into the semiconductor industry and I was a project manager there and I was able to retire early. So when I retired early, it was like, okay, now I can do all the stuff I really wanted to do. And so one of them was to go back and investigate this whole idea about UFOs. Was it real or not real or, or what? So I did that beginning in 2006 it's hard to believe that's 15 years ago. But uh, I, I started with an organization called MUFON. I was a director of research from the beginning when I first joined. And I stayed there for almost 10 years. So I would say in the last, since 2006, I probably average kind of like what you do on, on all these FOIAs, uh, which is more than just UFOs. Uh, I average 15 to 20 hours a week on this subject. So you know, over 15 years, I probably have more information on this now than I do in the degree that I, I obtained in chemistry over four years. Yeah, no, yeah. And, and obviously very dedicated uh, w with that amount of time going into this. So let me ask you, why is that? Why do you dedicate that much time to it? Do you feel that there's one particular case that has stuck out to you that says, hey, look, this is a real phenomena and I need to stick with this? Yeah, I don't think there's any single case that says, okay, this is absolutely real. I can prove it with this one case. Um, for me, it's more of, of just the scientific curiosity of this and, and the people you get to meet. I mean, you meet so many interesting people in person. And that drives me as much as the phenomenon itself. Uh, it, it's really, uh, 
I don't know, it just grabbed a hold of me. I've never seen a UFO myself, uh, but it's the study of the subject that I enjoy. I'm with you in that category. I haven't seen anything myself. I'm, I go outside. I look all the time. I want to see something, but never have yet. But, uh, but that said, after all these years, before we start drilling down into some more detail, but after all these years, if you could kind of sum up what you feel is a conclusion, or if you haven't concluded anything yet, what your, what your most prevalent theory is about the phenomena and what it is, what would that be? Well, the only thing I can say for certain about the phenomenon is it physically exists. It's, it's not just a ball of light. There's a physicality to it. It's intelligently controlled. Beyond that, I can't say anything for certain. Uh, I can hypothesize, you know, well, where's the most likely source of a physical object that's intelligently controlled? So if I had to, you know, put a theory out, it would probably be the extraterrestrial hypothesis. And, and it's important that all your viewers understand that doesn't mean I'm saying that is what it is. I'm just saying that's what I think is the most likely explanation based on the information at hand. But that could change if we get better information. So what do you feel uh, is the strongest indicator of that hypothesis? I think to me, the strongest indicator is the large number of extrasolar planets that are out there. Um, and it's important to realize when we say there's 4,000 plus planets, that's 4,000 plus planets with a very identified type of detection system. There are many planets out there we can't detect with the type of detection system we have. So if you extrapolated it, uh, there are easily hundreds of thousands of planets out there. Yeah, it seems like everywhere they look, they're finding these things. They're they're discovering these exoplanets. I remember I got to interview for History Channel show uh, Dr. Jeffrey Marcy, who d discovered and is tagged as discovering some of the original, I forget how many, uh, list of exoplanets. But now it's like they're discovering them every eight and a half seconds, you know, wherever they look. <laughs> So yeah. let me kind of drill into that concept a little bit with you. It, it That would definitely address extraterrestrial life being out there. I think scientifically, mathematically, you know, just even logically, they're out there. Is there something that makes you believe they've come here to the planet Earth? Yes. Uh, and this is just deductive reasoning. And... I'll, I'll just take this from our own capabilities, right? So already we're at a point where we can detect the planets and we're within 20 to 30 years of being able to detect the chemical constituents in a planet's atmosphere. So what does that mean? Well, if someone was looking at Earth, that means they could see hydrocarbons in our atmosphere. They might even be able to see uh, isotopes of plutonium and uranium from our above ground tests. And uh, they could probably, if they're able to mask out the sun as their telescope stares at us, see that on the night side of this planet, we're emitting incandescent light, which is a wavelength that is not natural. So any intelligent species is going to do what we're doing. They're not going to just jump from star to star saying, okay, wh wh where is their life? They're going to look at the entire area around their star system. And so when they see us, when they look at our planet, they know that there's life here. And at that point in time, the question is only, can they get here, right? Because they know that there's intelligence here, but can they get here? So if you make the assumption that they're capable of getting here, then they're going to send craft here. It's the same thing we would do. And actually, we, we already have that on the drawing boards. There's a called the Breakthrough Project, where we have a plan to send a very small, uh, you might call it a miniature spaceship, to Alpha Centauri at 20% the speed of light, which means in 20 years, you're there. And that's at our level of technology, right? Someone 100 years more advanced, I'm sure, can do a lot more. So I want to ask you about the organization that I believe you founded, the Scientific Coalition for UAP Studies. Can you tell me a little bit about what that organization is and what you all are trying to uh, accomplish? 
Sure, myself and uh, Richard Hoffman and Morgan Beal in the in the fall of 2017 founded a nonprofit organization uh, called the Scientific Coalition of UAP Studies. And there's a website if any of your viewers want to learn more about it. It's called Explore S C U dot org. And basically, it's an organization whose purpose is to scientifically investigate the phenomenon and, other, and use basic scientific protocols. So scientific reasoning throughout the whole process. Uh, currently today, and this is, we've been in existence about three and a half years. We have over 120 members, 28% uh, of our membership are PhDs. We have uh, professors from universities, uh, NASA employees, people who are in the defense industry, people who are in the high tech industry, uh, over half of the SCU membership actually have advanced degrees. So either a master's or PhDs. It's kind of like uh, what J. Allen Hynek created when he did the Invisible College. Uh, because there's so much stigma with the UAP subject, uh, many of your people in the science field have concerns, you know, even researching this subject. So we, we provide that outlet. And actually, most of our membership is, is not anonymous of the 120. We may have 10 that are anonymous, but most of them are comfortable with this subject today. You had mentioned the stigma. Do, do you believe that there are things going on right now that's, that's kind of making that stigma go away? Do you think it's getting better when it comes to the general public's perception of what this phenomena is? I, I think that the two things that have occurred that have really helped minimize that stigma was the December 17th, 2017, a New York Times article, right, which highlighted this 2004 event involving Navy F-18s. And the second thing was when the Navy actually came out and admitted that there are UAPs flying over their territory and area of control that they don't know what they are. Now, you've done a lot of FOIA requests. You may not know this. I'm a fan of that. So I'm, I'm a big <laughs> advocate for those using the FOIA. And I know that you've done a lot of research when it comes to the Nimitz encounter and, and incidents related to that. Can I ask what your experience is trying to dig up information about the Nimitz incident? Yes, yes. Uh, now, you're probably an order of magnitude beyond me on FOIA submissions, uh, oh. <laughs> John, but I, I have submitted I found one or many, two. Yeah, <laughs> I have submitted many dozens myself. I, I can tell you prior to the New York Times event, before they even came out, I had submitted 20 FOIAs to every Navy agency that I could think of regarding the 2004 event, because I was already aware of that event before it hit the New York Times. Every one of those FOIAs, I received a response back that they had no information related to it. And that included, you know, naval investigations, uh, the Pacific naval area, the Marines in the Pacific, et cetera. Um, I never finally got a positive comment back from the Navy until I appealed um, and I appealed and it goes to JAG and the JAG Navy guys, I, th I think they just wanted to throw me a bone. So they went a step further and they went and interviewed some Marines that happened to be majors and lieutenant colonels. And one of the Marines uh, said in an email to JAG, which they provided me this email, mm -hmm. he said, oh, Tic Tacs? Yeah, we know all about the Tic Tacs. What would you like to know? And that was, and I got that piece of information in, oh, the middle of 2017. And when I saw that, I would, that was the first ding, you know, like, there is something to, the, to this. Uh, this isn't just a made-up story. And just to clarify and, and give you props for this, you said mid-2017. The general public really didn't know about the Nimitz incident as big uh, as it's become until December of that year. So you were very much ahead of the curve, right? Right. 
Yeah, I and, was already researching it. And and how how was that? How did you very quickly? How did you learn about it to start filing FOIAs and start digging into that in, in, encounter? So in the summer of 2016, uh, an individual told me about this event, and I can't disclose who he was because you know that's he's he was my source, and he said, Robert, go Google F-18s. UFOs and USS Nimitz. And I did that. And I fact, when I did that, I ran across that Navy site uh, by, um, what's his name? Chicherry? Paco Chicherry, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. So I found his article, which was written actually in 2015, in, in late 2015. And when I read it, I, I was, I was pretty, excited because it, this was not a ufo site this was a purebred navy site and here were navy guys talking about this ufo encounter and i had to educate myself on all these naval terms right off the bat to figure out you know what was this guy talking about and so once i read that i said okay this is you know there's validity to this and that's what generate got me to generate all my FOIA requests. Now, we know that the video had leaked out many years ago before December of 2000, 2017. Um, I assume you were aware of that while you were doing all this research, or did you not see that until later? I had not. Uh, yes, I was not aware that the video had leaked out prior to my doing this research. Now, once I began doing the research, I found that video on, online and i started reading through it was about it was on above top secret and reading through it and you know what really dismayed was to me was as i was reading through it it was clear that everyone was just attacking the person that had provided the video and this information rather than trying to say you know asking questions where did you get it can, can we get more information blah 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 and so finally, this person just shuts down and, and stops communicating. So there's probably so much more that we might have been able to get uh, back then if people just had been open minded and not, uh, you know, trying to be debunking what this guy had presented. I've noticed that a lot that the general populace, when it comes to this, wants evidence and people and stuff to look at. And when they get it, they trash it. For the most part, yeah. you know, I mean, you do have a small percentage that just loves it and, and they're, they're, they're big advocates for it coming out. But I just don't understand that. I don't again, uh, don't get the attacking and the uh, essentially the, the the war that they've waged. They meaning just this online group of trolls that go after people. But I think that that's a, a different a different show in itself. So, oh, yeah, you could do a whole psychology show. On yeah. That. And it really, I'm fascinated by that because I see the reaction to people and, and uh, the, the funny one for me very quickly is, you know, as, as you know, I just came out with this interview with James Woolsey, former CIA director, talking about UFOs, small part of the interview, but he laid some bombshells and everybody's advocating for disclosure. They want the government to come out and say something. And now these government officials are. And then the, 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 the majority of what you see are people saying, well, they're government. We can't believe anything they say. Well, what are, what are you yeah. fighting for disclosure for? Like, I, that's what I don't get. It's like this huge contradiction. But anyway, so I, I always get a kick out of it because there is this just very odd uh, psychology to, to a lot of this. Um, but let's focus in on the video. So through uh, SCU, you guys had analyzed the video uh, and and really dug in. I mean, you did this huge paper on it. Tell me a little bit about what you were intending with the research and what did you find out? Well, uh, the thing we did right off the bat was after that New York Times article hit. Uh, I had actually in October of 2017 got on a, uh, a show and talked about this right before uh, the Nimitz thing hit the New York Times. And so I had a, a sailor actually contact me from that show. And it happened to be Kevin Day, someone you're very familiar with. So uh, I interviewed him before. I don't think anyone interviewed him prior to when I interviewed him. But I, I did not publicize my interview. I, I kept it uh, 
private. And the reason I did that, John, is because people, as they begin talking about events and sharing ideas with other people, you, your memory starts to change. You start adapting what you hear from someone else and, it, it, and your brain just kind of incorporates it into your story. Uh, so I, I wanted to keep those siloed and isolated as much as I could. So immediately after talking to Kevin Day, which was January of 2018, uh, I went on the Facebook site for the USS Princeton, and I just started looking for people. And I was able to get a hold of Gary uh, Boris. And in talking to him, I established he had not talked to Kevin Day at the time I interviewed him and had not did not even remember Kevin Day because he said, well, hold on, let me look at my little album. So he goes to his you know, his Navy book on the Prince and says, oh, yeah, OK, I remember. And he was the senior chief. He was a sharp guy. But the reason I'm telling you this is of an important piece of information that I got from each of these guys independently. When I talked to Kevin Day, he indicated this object, right, that he picked up on the radar drop from it could have been 28,000, could have been 80,000 feet, but it dropped down to near the ocean level. So we use both numbers to calculate. And then I, and he said that happened in 0.78 seconds, right? So now we've got the numbers we need to do a calculation. Well, when I asked Gary Bortz the same question, I said, you saw it on radar. How fast did this thing drop towards the ocean? I did not tell him anything about what Kevin Day told me. He replied, how long did it tell, take you to generate that question in your head? And he said, that's how long it took to drop to the ocean. So I've got now two independent guys that allowed us to calculate a number we could feel reasonable about. And we did big error bars on it, right? It's like, what if these guys were wrong? What if it's one second, two seconds, six seconds? All of those numbers generate G-forces that are beyond anything we can uh, do with any aircraft or drones for that matter. So, and I'm sorry I strayed, but to jump back to your basic question, mm -hmm. you know, our analysis of this case, there were three basic points, and all three were related to extreme acceleration. One is what you mentioned in the beginning, the video. Two was what these two sailors told me they saw on radar in terms of movement across distance. And the third was actually from those Navy pilots who encountered the objects in the F-18s. And what they did is they told us very distinctly how long it took an object that was close to them to disappear from their sight. And that's then it just becomes trigonometry. You know, how far do you have to go to disappear from the eyesight of a human? And these are Navy pilots with very good eyesight. And again, we did it in a scientific manner, right? We didn't just say, okay, so come up with a number. We said, well, well, what if maybe his eyesight wasn't good or maybe something else happened? So if it if it didn't take one second, what if it took six seconds? How far would it have gone in six seconds? So we calculated a whole range of accelerations. And that range went anywhere from as low as 50 G-forces to as high as several thousand g-forces wow and to give your audience an idea of a g-force one g is you know what the earth is pulling on us six g's only six is when a pilot in an aircraft begins to black out unless he has special clothing by eight or nine g's it doesn't matter what he has on he will black out and by 15 g's that f-18's wings have ripped off of the aircraft and that's only 15 Gs. And we're talking about a range from 50 to thousands of G-forces. So to us, that was unexplainable. And, and it's not explainable by any technology that any nation on Earth has. How do you explain I, that? Meaning, are we just dealing with something we can't comprehend yet? Is this science that we haven't discovered yet? How do you address it? You know, it, in a way, I, I, I kind of say, well, it, it's almost like uh, Christopher Columbus watching an F-18 fly past his ship. How, how does he explain it? I, I don't think he's going to do a very good job. And I think the same is true for us. But we can give it 
a best guess, right? I, I can only see, you know, one of two possibilities. Either the object somehow has driven its, what you call it, its inertial mass towards zero so that you can have this instantaneous acceleration, or it's not really there in our atmosphere. In other words, it's, it's not really moving through our atmosphere because to move through our atmosphere at those speeds, you, you would become a fireball just like a meteorite that a meteor does as it's burning through the atmosphere. The heat generated would be too much for any metal to withstand. Uh, at those speeds, it, just as an example, the uh, these hypersonic uh, missiles that we fire that will travel at like Mach 10. When they're at Mach 10, the metal is beginning to soften, mm -hmm. and, and that's only 7,000 miles an hour. It's beginning to soften and starting to melt, but it only has to stay in shape for a few seconds or a minute before it hits its target. Um, that that's that's the problem you're looking at with our level of technology to do something like this with the video itself obviously you analyzed uh what some of the witnesses were telling you and and coming up with some fairly amazing numbers when it comes to g-forces when it comes to the video itself are we talking about a different point in the encounter a different encounter or what what can we deduce from from that video which uh and correct me if i'm wrong but the FLIR one out of the three that we know right now official now officially released by the navy uh but but the one you're referring to is the FLIR one right the FLIR one and actually i'll just note john i consider it the the weakest of the three pieces of information the pilot testimony I consider the strongest, followed secondly by the, the naval radar guys. The, the video itself, and, and people always say, well, where's the photograph of the UFO? Where's the video? Of the, that's no more valuable than the human looking. You, you really want a person involved with whatever you see. But in the case of that video, this occurs after the F-18 encounter by another F-18 jet who goes out to find this object. So he's searching for it. And what we looked at was the acceleration that you see when the object first moves across. And it's important your audience probably understands that for a F-18's FLIR system to lose lock is a would be a very unusual situation. Those systems are designed for fighters aircraft in combat, which are using six and seven G turns and not lose a lock on his target because if he loses lock and his target doesn't lose lock on him, he's in trouble because a missile is about to be fired at him. So, I mean, can you explain that a little bit more then? Like, what does that mean essentially with that losing lock being part of the story? Uh, if, if the aircraft did not lose lock, then that means this object accelerated uh, what we calculated in the neighborhood of 50 G's to go across as fast as you saw it uh, move. Uh, additionally, sometimes people say, oh, well, maybe that was another aircraft. The U.S. Navy jets have systems that detect not only a transponder from another aircraft, but even if the aircraft does not have a transponder, let's say it was a MiG-25, it knows that's a MiG-25 based on the electronic signature. In other words, how that MiG is moving through the atmosphere, the IR you know, sequencing that you see on it, all those things together allows a U.S. Navy jet to identify any jet that's around it. And additionally, all those radar systems on the Princeton would have said, you know, you've got another aircraft, you know, in your area. So I, all those things together to me indicate this was not a jet that they were looking at. 
there's obviously been some skepticism out there against not only the FLIR one, but but all the videos and anything related with UFOs. There's a, a very short list of prominent people that always like to poo poo the entire idea, like Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson, who I worked with and like a lot. Uh, so I'm not speaking ill about him, but obviously he's kind of um, an outspoken person on UFOs. You've got Dr. Seth Shostak, uh, and I give the same caveat. I've worked with him as well and spent time with him at the SETI Institute. I have a lot of respect for him but they all kind of seemingly think that this is not interesting mick west is another one now for those of my audience who follow me on social media we thought we were going to have mick today he had an open invitation um and i'll just add we don't i, I don't like to talk about private communications or behind the scenes stuff um but sadly it just didn't seem like there was interest to 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 do this. So Robert had followed through with that invitation. And I appreciate that, Robert. Um, and Mick is always welcome back. He's been on the show before. We would have loved to have had a, a shared dialogue. So for those curious about what happened on social media, again, we very much tried to make it work out and it just didn't. So that being said, though, about these skeptics, you know, and, and generalize, we don't have to talk about anybody specifically now. But generalized, there is that skepticism towards this, but it seems like the skepticism comes from those that don't have the background in this particular science. And I interviewed a man by the name of David Aguilar a year or two ago on this show, brilliant mind, worked uh, at Harvard University, uh, has a great science background. And he says, when you talk about stuff like this, do you want an astronomer to look at it? Do you want an astrobiologist, meaning the those areas of science are very specific to what they know uh so it's like why are we hearing some of these names really kind of trash this topic specifically even these videos dr shostak i know specifically spoke about it uh, on his seti program and seemed very uneasy with the details and stuff like that so with that preface i want to ask you what are the skeptics missing why is it so hard being uh, at least some of them anyway, members of science with degrees. Um, what are they missing from all of this and why won't they look at it? Well, it, it's just like any other scientific subject. If you don't investigate it, you really should not comment on it. Uh, in the case of, of Neil or in the case of Seth, they haven't studied the subject. You know, they've read some newspaper articles. They've lightly touched on it. They no more should discuss the reality of or the reality against uh, UAPs than they should about talking about uh, genetics, which they know nothing about. Uh, so that's the key thing. Anyone who's been trained in science, whether it's Seth, myself, or someone else, once you're trained and you go in and study something, then you can comment on it. But it doesn't matter how well I'm trained in science. If I haven't studied the subject, I can't com on it, comment on it. So I don't comment on genetics. I don't comment on geology or subjects that I've not not studied. And I think that's the problem with them. That they're just making, they get in front of a news camera. Someone asks them. They feel like they're an authority. The media acts like they're an authority. So they feel like they're forced to comment. So they try. I mean, the reality is someone without any degree who had studied using a scientific uh, method, because there are people that understand the scientific method that are not degreed, um, is going to be more, uh, I guess you could say not an expert, but someone better to listen to than Seth or Neil when they haven't studied the subject. Now, now there there have been and, and again i want to just bring it up because he's very prominent in posting videos and that would be mick west which is why we wanted to, uh, to invite him on for this discussion but i at least want to give you an opportunity if you want to to address some of the skepticism that he has posed specifically about the FLIR one uh correct me if i'm wrong from what i understand anyway i think he's arguing that the camera uh, is moving or loses lock, and that's what makes the visual appearance of this thing darting off. 
uh, but it sounds like that that's not necessarily the case. Now, I just want to say I have an open invitation for him. We, I'm not trying to speak about him behind his back. He knows that he was invited. Um, so if you rather not answer, that's okay. But is there something that you would like to address about his rebuttals and very public posting of his rebuttals and videos? Yeah, uh, Nick, uh, Mick basically likes to zero in on a particular piece of the overall case and try to debunk it. He doesn't look at the case as a whole. So, and that was what I was trying to get him to understand and why I wanted to debate him on the subject, which would inform all the listeners. This isn't just a case about a video. And it's not just a case about did the video lose lock. The the part that Nick's arguing, Mick is arguing, is that it loses lock. And so the movement you see is basically movement that was already there prior to losing lock. Um, and that is that possible? Yes, that's possible. Does that mean this event didn't happen and that these objects did not show extreme acceleration? No, it doesn't. Because as I pointed out earlier, there are three events. The video is just one of those three, and I consider it the weaker of the, the three. Um, the problem I have with Mick, and I won't go into it more than just this, and I brought this up with him before on two things. One, you, you have to look at a whole case. You don't just look at a piece. And number two, in the scientific method, you're always open-minded. Uh, you want all the information you can get. Mick doesn't want the information because I asked him, I said, why don't you FOIA and ask for more information? If, if you think there's not enough information here, why don't you go get more? But that's not what he's trying to do. He's just trying to destroy an argument and go to his next argument. He, he is not, he has not, as like most debunkers have not done, they have not truly studied the phenomenon with an open mind and really researched it. And I was surprised at that and, and a little let down uh, just because I feel that this field does need to be challenged. I love being challenged if I come out with a document or something or make a claim based on certain evidence and somebody throws a rebuttal at me. I love that because it makes me do more. It makes me be better. Right. It makes me keep searching. Um, so, yeah, I, I was uh, let down at that. And, 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 and again, scientists as a whole that I feel that they are just overlooking a lot of this evidence uh, in addition to witness testimony. And then they love to dismiss that because you don't have evidence. This case has all of it. And they go, well, no, we still don't want to look at it. It's like, yeah, well, what are you yeah, really, it, you know, what are you um, what are you really looking at? You know, what are you really, really looking for? Yeah. And that's something they're, that they're looking for a, a, a UFO landing on the White House lawn. But then even then, I think that they will have a story. You know, I, th I think that they will um, dismiss it somehow. They will figure out a story. And I think it's just going to be this never ending battle. I just I uh, do you. And let me ask you, though, I'll turn it into a question. Do you think that will ever end? I mean, do you I don't think that they're going to land on the White House lawn, nor do I think the president is going to come out and have a disclosure that that everybody wants. Yeah, I just don't see that happening. But do you think that there will ever be a bridged gap between the what I'll call the mainstream science? Because there's a lot of scientists involved in SCU that are incredibly reputable, intelligent, and exactly what we want. But I'm talking about like the quote unquote mainstream, the people that you do see on television, do you think there will be a bridged gap between, we'll call it us and them? I think there will be at some point in time, but that could be 30 to 40 years from now. I don't think it will happen until it's obvious that the UAP is, is real. Once that becomes obvious, then you'll see everyone pile on as if uh, this is the first time anyone knew anything about it and they're researching it to death, right? Even though it's been around for 70 years. Does SCU focus on other cases as well? Obviously you're very well known for doing the FLIR analysis, but uh, what are some of the other cases that you guys have looked at and what have you found? Well, you know, the other cases we've looked at was Aguadilla, uh, which was a, a Homeland Security video. And that, that one is totally puzzling. And then the Stephenville case, that, that's actually before uh, we created the SCU. And 
that case we got a lot of radar data on and is a very interesting case. Uh, we actually have projects within SCU that we're working on. Um, one project, and this is one I'll uh, present on at our conference, is related to how do you take a bunch of data where 90 to 99 percent of it is garbage, and how do you find a pattern in the very small percentage that's in there? Uh, another project we have is on uh, U what we call USOs, underwater submersible objects, and there we were looking at all USO cases in history to look for patterns. And the reason we picked USOs was because with a typical UAP, there's always a question, are you looking at Venus? Are you looking at an aircraft, you know, that you could mix up? In the case of USO, it's a little harder to misinterpret what you're seeing. I mean, it's still possible. There are things that, you know, that can trick an observer, but you eliminate a lot of them if you concentrate just on USOs. Can, and then sorry, I don't mean to, to, to go away from USOs. I, I wanted to just ask you about the Aguadilla case, though, can, if I can go back to that. Your analysis, uh, and I'll go ahead and link the video in the show notes. Uh, I've talked a, a little bit about it before on this show, but never uh, in depth with somebody who's analyzed the, the photo. So if you're curious about what the Aguadilla uh, video is, just definitely check either if you're watching on YouTube in the notes or just go to theblackvault.com slash show notes. That will also have uh, Robert's website for SCU, this video, and some of the other stuff that we've talked about, including his paper. But about Aguadilla, so what is it that you can conclude about that particular case? You know, Aguadilla is, is it's kind of different than your typical, you know, UAP. It, it's not, uh, it's not large. It's only three to five feet in size. It's definitely has a physical uh, physicality to it. Uh, but, but what was so unique about this case is, one, when it impacts the water, there's, we can find a very minimal impact, but there's almost no impact. And the speed of the object just barely changes as it goes into the water. It slows down just, just a small amount. But it splits in half once it comes out of the water. That was the most interesting part. When I first saw that video, I said, oh, another object came out of the water. It must have joined up with it, or maybe it's a reflection right but once we looked at it frame by frame it was the most amazing thing i did i'd ever seen you have a certain number of pixels that make up the object and in this case it was about 40 pixels that made up the you know the entire object you see that you're every 30th of a second on each frame the number of pixels increases until you've got about 80 pixels and so you've doubled in size and now there was a, a warm heat center in the middle that began to double. And then the next thing you see, you just see it start to pinch off on the heat center so that you're now getting two heat centers and two objects. And, and then the next thing you know, you, you've got two separate objects, the same size as the first one that you started with. It's just like mitosis in a cell. Um, I have no explanation for that. All I can say is that's what, the video showed now i'm no scientist but i'm guessing that's not a balloon right that is that is not a balloon and you know that's the, the crazy thing the debunkers they go oh you you could fit this is a balloon if you, you know with the following if this happens and this happens and this happens okay that that's fine but you have the issue how does it split you have the infrared heat signature. How do you match that up with the balloon? But it's like they just throw that out and say, oh, well, you know, must be a balloon. Yeah. I, yeah. I was amazed. I watched some, and again, I won't point fingers, but I was watching a couple prominent skeptics debate a video that I had posted uh, that somebody had contacted me. And, and in short, I don't know what it was, but it, it looked like, you know, a bunch of objects. They were filming the 
uh, moon through a telescope and there was a bunch of objects that flew by. And there's a couple types of videos floating around like that. But this one was really kind of intriguing. One of the skeptics said, not birds, I'm convinced uh, there's wing flap, there's this, that, and the other thing. The other one was saying it's balloons and they put forward... They couldn't even agree, right? Which is fine. I, I and I like that conversation, but it was like after they couldn't agree, and and it really was kind of this question mark. They just left it alone. They're like, uh, well, I'm sure it's solved, and went on. It's like, well, you can't do that. You do, you're you're omitting so much during these analyses. And that's what I keep finding with skeptics and debunkers, which I, again, you go back to that psychology, which I find fascinating because if they really truly want to analyze and debunk it, then deal with, uh, with, with the entire envelope of evidence. And it just doesn't seem like they're doing that. And I, I don't understand why do you, do you think they want to just d debunk that that is, that is their only effort, not necessarily explain, but I, I thought debunker was a bad word. Some of them like to be called that. I felt debunkers just no matter what you showed them, you show them a blue house and they will debunk it and try and prove it's red. Do you think that that's what their intent is just to just to put whatever theory out there as long as it's not what you want them to believe or what you have concluded? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that's the only because it to a true scientist first, the first thing you want is all the data you can get. And if you look at any of the debunkers, you don't see them out there submitting FOIAs and saying, can I have some more data? Uh, do we have data here? Do we have data here? Can I analyze it? No, they just say, what data do I have? Okay, let's see. How do I yeah. argue yeah. against any possible? And it, it just seems like they don't want to do that legwork and they don't want to talk to those people that have really either been there and done analysis, meaning field work or people with more of a background in that particular niche science to allow us to try and, you know, unravel these, these mysteries. When it, when it comes to the government's reaction to a lot of this, this has to be throwing the skeptics a little bit for a loop because I'm surprised as well. Let's talk about the FLIR 1 uh, again for a second with the Navy saying before they ever even uh, released the video saying, yeah, we have no idea what these things are, that they considered them unidentified. Now, even though I respect some of the skeptics that are out there, they, they are very intelligent people, and I'm sure that some of them have their heart in the right place. It's hard to believe that the power, the might, the intelligence that's behind the United States military and the Navy can't figure out something. So you have two options. They're lying. And they can figure it out, but they don't want to tell you, which doesn't make sense to me be because it makes them look worse. They should just say it's classified or whatever. And then you kind of right. can't do anything about it. Um, or they're telling the truth and they have absolutely no idea what this is. When it comes to the military, what do you think they are doing at this point? Do you think they're being more open? Do you think it's all part of a cover up disinformation campaign? What do you think they're they're up to? Yeah, I'm, I'm not a big you know, I, I'm not really into the, uh, you know, the the hidden disinformation campaigns too much. I, th I think in general, uh, giant bureaucracies operate as giant bureaucracies. So I think when they say they have no idea what it is, that's somewhat true. Mm -hmm. uh, but clearly, they've got the radar data from the USS Princeton, right? In other words, they they didn't release the videos and throw away the radar data which is orders of magnitude more valuable than the video. So they know what the object speed is. So it's true when they say, no, we don't know what it is, but clearly they knew how fast that object was moving. There can't be any doubt about that. So my view is they don't know the source of these objects. You know, they don't know where they come from. They don't know what they are. The only thing they know is they exist and and you're left with the same problem the Air Force had. What do you tell the public when they ask you, well, what are you doing about it? You know, the, the answer, um, well, I'm Christopher Columbus and I can't do anything about an F-18 doesn't go very well with the public. So that's the conundrum. I think a lot of people also don't realize that they're holding back information 
about this. I, I know that you yourself have done FOIA requests and there's a, a information, what, missing? I think the, the, the deck log, you've tried to, to get the deck logs mm-hmm. and deck logs are mysteriously missing. Uh, researcher Christopher Lambright uh, made headlines about, a, I think, a year or so ago seeking information and it came up with a top secret presentation that included something, I believe, with, with the Nimitz or at least related cases. So there, they have this mound, however big that mound is, of classified information, and they still are willing to say to the public, we have absolutely no idea what this is. And that to me is is very fascinating. That leads me to one of my last questions for you as we, we kind of approach the end here, and that is the coming UAP report. We hope anyway, I, my prediction is it's not going to come as planned uh, schedule-wise, but if it comes this year, hopefully it does, June 1st or June 31st, whatever the date, the going date is anyway, that it's going to be here, we're going to get this UAP report. With your experience and, and your background, what do you think is going to be in it? Okay, so before I answer that, John, let me just comment sure. that the SCU has actually sent a letter to those key senators on the Senate uh, Intelligence Committee, and we've sent them a shortened version of the Nimitz report. And we've also told them we're glad to sign NDAs, whatever they require, and we're glad to provide an opinion on whatever the Navy sends them in this report. Um, and so far, we haven't received any, you know, any replies mm-hmm. back. Um, to your question, uh, I suspect my view is going to be similar to yours. I will be very pleasantly shocked if any information is provided beyond something along the lines of we are investigating this with uh, due haste, right? I I don't think we'll get anything. Uh, And to my knowledge, there is no requirement on the Navy or the DOD to have to provide information to the public. It's only they have to provide information to a Senate Intelligence Committee, which they could provide it under classified, you know, uh, arenas. So. Yeah. Yeah. In essence, they're, the, the committee's asking for a public unclassified report. So hopefully we'll get something. But the fine print, and I did a video on this yeah. channel for, for those watching and, and aren't aware, I, I pulled up. Uh, public reports from actually DNI that's going to be heading doing this report and showing how classified annexes work and how you see them in reports. And I just pulled one at random, not related to UFOs. And it's amazing where you see the information, a paragraph or two, and then underneath almost everything, there's extra information in the classified annex. And that's what I fear is going to happen is that they give us fluff on uh, what we already know. You know, they're going to take the FLIR 1 gimbal and go fast and, you know, essentially give some dates and, and a little bit of information, fluff it up a little, but there'll be nothing new. And then in, in that fine print underneath, there's going to be that, that, that citation for the classified annex. I hope I'm wrong. I really do. Uh, because I, I would, I hope we're both wrong. Yeah, I would love to see something. I just think with the decades and decades and decades of of secrecy, just because we're getting media attention now in a somewhat serious light, and sent the Senate's asking a question uh, of the intelligence community, I don't think that's going to change much. But hey, I, I can't wait. I'm you know counting down the time to to when that's actually going to happen uh you had mentioned earlier robert the scu is going to have a conference uh give me a little bit more detail can people attend is it online in person uh what's what are the Uh, details yeah we're going to have an exciting conference it's just going to be a online conference um they can go to the scu site which is explore scu dot org and just to give you a taste of some of the people, uh, Dr. Hal Putoff will be our opening speaker, and he's going to talk about how do you move from intelligence gathering to science data gathering on this subject. Uh, we'll have Dr. Kevin Knuth, who's a professor, uh, who will be talking about a galactic model of how do you look at how a species would move through the galaxy. Um, Dr. Michael Masters is going to talk about hominid shapes and how they change as we advance as a species. 
uh, Dr. Silvano Colombano, who recently retired from NASA, is going to talk about a cost-benefit analysis on the UAP subject. And uh, we're also going to have information uh, from Skyhub and UFO uh, DAP, which are programs that basically try to collect data uh, by having remote telescopic type systems. I'm going to give a, a, a talk on how do you analyze all of this data? Um, and then Peter Reale is going to give a talk on the Drake equation. Dr. Matthew Sendegas is going to talk on dark matter in UAPs, which will be an interesting subject. I'm not sure the relationship, but I'm sure we'll hear. Um, all of these guys are uh, very sharp individuals who, who take the UAP subject seriously and think it is worth analyzing. So when is it going to be? And, and is it is it open to the public? It is open to the public. It's June 5th to June 6th. So just if anyone is interested in attending, just go to our website and it will give you a link where you can register for the conference. We're limited to the first 500 uh, people. Uh, that's just software limitations for an online conference that we have. So, And yeah, I think you just answered my next question. So it is online only or will there be in-person attendance as well? It, it will be online only. Gotcha. And so it will be a combination of software packages actually that allows the attendees, you'll be able to interact with other people that go to the conference. You can set up a little side table, have discussions. We'll even, we even have a little generated uh, meeting group where for an hour, every 10 minutes, we just randomly pull four people together and stick them at a table where they meet each other and talk for 10 minutes and they get sent to another table. So it will be a lot of fun. That's awesome. I'm looking forward to COVID being on, uh, being over just so we can all hang out again and 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 be at a table. But the, some of this technology that has really kind of accelerated here through the COVID pandemic, it's kind of fun to see the the capability of online conferences and people that don't want to have human interaction anymore face to face. Uh, you know, it is though. It, there's some pretty interesting tools that have come out of all of this, but you know. You can't beat having a beer with uh, yeah. your friends at a conference. It's no, no, not at all. I miss those days. I'm looking forward to them again. But I wish you all the best with the conference. So, again, it's www.explorescu.org, correct? Correct. Perfect. And yeah. I, I will link that in the show notes. Again, if you don't know how to get there, go to www.theblackvault.com slash show notes. Find this episode. Or if you're watching on YouTube, it's all down there in the description. And of course, thumbs up and helping spread the word about the channel and Robert's interview is always very much a help. Robert, uh, again, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. I wish you all the best with your research. Uh, you're on a very short list of people in the UFO field that I highly respect uh, because you, you, you push forward for answers and you're doing the work. Uh, not many people are doing that. So just want to uh, take a moment to recognize that and just say thank you. Well, thank you, John. It was great being on your show. As always, I enjoy talking with you. Yes, and you as well. And thank you guys all for listening and watching. This is John Greenwald Jr. signing off. We'll see you next time.